Here's uh, scientists, archaeologists, historians, biblical scholars um, have been asking the question, was Noah's flood real? And of course, people of a, of a religious bent, and certainly in the Abrahamic faiths, uh, they believe it is. But we, we atheists tend to think of everything biblical as being mythical, which is not necessarily the case. And uh, tonight we have someone who's going to uh, present uh, scientific evidence that a flood actually occurred. Our guest is Dr. Walter C. Pittman III. He is a professor in uh, Columbia University's Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. He's an award-winning uh, marine geophysicist. Say that backwards three times. Uh, he asserts that there is enough geological evidence that scientists are able to say with certainty that Noah's flood took place in the Black Sea at around uh, uh, 5500 BCE. And he and his colleague, William Ryan, have written a book entitled Noah's Flood, which has been published in nine different languages, including Japanese and Hebrew, and is available on Amazon. Uh, they reveal, they have, uh, the research has revealed that there apparently it was, it was a terrifying rapid rise in sea level. And uh, to anyone living in Mesopotamia at the time, of course, that would have seemed like the end of the world. So uh, it's a fascinating story, and I'm, I'm going to get out of the way and uh, let the expert uh, do the talking. So please uh, welcome Dr. Walter C. Pittman. Kill flow over Niagara Falls. For how long? Oh, uh, uh, at least probably, uh, probably at least a month or so, and then it would have begun to slow down as the uh, a level of the water in the Black Sea began to reach, uh, to encroach on the Bosporus. It would have slowed down. But, uh, uh, okay, the rate, of, the rate at which the, uh, the water of the Black Sea encroached the Danube Delta, that huge area between the Crimea and Romania, people would have had to move inland two kilometers every day. The water was coming in through it. Not fair, it wasn't rushing in. It was just the water was coming in. They had to get out of the way. They had to take grandma, grandpa, the goats, the kids. They had to eat on the way. They had to somehow survive. There were no safe ways or anything like that. They just had to somehow survive and, and march inland away from this water. Another thing, very important, is that uh, as this water came through here, uh, it, the, the energy that it dissipated was something like shooting off a 25 kiloton atomic bomb about every three or four minutes. So the noise would have been absolutely horrendous. And these people were not too far from that noise, only a few hundred kilometers. Um, did this, uh, Tammy, did this thing it meant that you were in the way. I was, I was being, yeah, I was being, okay. Uh, yeah, Yeah. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay. The Black Sea is drying out. I'm going to go back and forth across this several times. It's drying out. And sea level is rising. The, the, the ice is not hot. Poof, it comes through. <laughs> Tanya did this. She made this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just fabulous, yeah. Okay, I'll go back and we'll do that again. Let's see that. Okay, here we go. It's drying out. That's that long period, maybe a thousand years, maybe more when it dried out. People are moving out onto this light green air. It's good farming out there, a good place. Whoosh, done, yes. gone, all in one shot like that. Uh, uh, keep your eye on the uh, uh, on the on here. It's, it's sea level is rising in here, and uh, it's, it's rising and rising and rising. But it's not communicating. So in here, the sea level is rising, and finally, to there, it reached a critical level. It bursts and cuts uh, cuts the Bosporus wide open. Um, so, this is what it's like. Just back and forth showing you the amount of land that was uh, flooded. An uh, uh, area of land about the size of Florida. Uh, but back then, you know, people weren't scattered all over the world, you know, and this was 
probably one of their high spots of civilization. They had farming had developed in this area, uh, and around it, it was one of the areas where farming had really gotten underway, and uh, it was a, just a pure catastrophe for probably most of these people. Okay. Uh, anybody there? That's the great question. Who would have been affected by this flood? Uh, the back, there's the Black Sea up at the top. We're looking to the east on a curved surface of the Earth at the Black Sea. We're looking right across. And these spots are places where people might have settled if they had come out of the Black Sea, places to the west of the, of the Black Sea. Uh, and this is quite speculative. Uh, a lot of the archaeologists are, are not too happy with us about this. Uh, but he, he, these are some people who we ran across. I mean, we didn't actually meet these people. <laughs> they're, unfortunately, they're long gone. But uh, people who may have fled out of the Black Sea are people called linear band farmer, pot, linear, linear pottery farmers, or linear band ceramic, and a lot of people called the Vincha. And these people uh, suddenly appeared in southern, uh, southeastern Europe and then appeared all the way across uh, 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 to the Paris Basin. I'll give you a little comment about them in just a minute here. Yeah, about them. The explosive, explosive expansion of the LBK across Europe reflects colonization by expanding farming populations in a time period so brief as not to be resolved by radiocarbon dating. In other words, with the radiocarbon dating, they can't really tell from the radiocarbon alone whether these people started in the east and moved to the west, or whether they started in the west and moved to the east. I know which way they went. They went from the east to the west because they stuck at the Paris Basin. You know, you've got to the Paris Basin, it's paradise. Why are you going to leave the Paris Basin? <laughs> Nobody in their right mind is going to do that. And anyway, um, uh, and and uh, a, a, a Portuguese archaeologist independently found that all of these areas in uh, Italy, uh, uh, southern France, and Spain, and Portugal were all settled by farmers almost all at the same time uh, 7,500 years ago, 5,500 BC. Almost all of them, all people. And he, he, had, he had no idea of what, what uh, our proposal was about there having been a flood. But there they appeared very suddenly uh, uh, at that time. Uh, an, another very interesting thing about these people, these, uh, I'll just move on a little bit here. This is some of the, uh, this, these, these, uh, this is some of the pottery of these linear band people. This is the kind of houses they built. Uh, and a very interesting thing we have found recently about them is that not only, did, uh, and, and the archaeologists do, don't yet even mention the fact that they might have come from the Black Sea, but, uh, for which I don't blame them, because we, when Bill and I wrote the paper and, and wrote the book, we got an awful lot of heat from a lot of geologists saying that this, this flood never occurred, and now we know it did. So the archaeologists, you know, were reasonable to ignore it. But one of the most important things that came of this was that um, these people, whoever they were, brought with them uh, what's called, what's, it's called an alel, and it enabled the people, they, they could drink milk. The people who were living in Europe at that time, for the most part, couldn't. It was rare, the ability, their ability to, to drink and digest milk. What I didn't realize is that human beings, obviously they drink milk when they're young. They drink their mother's milk or can drink cow's milk. When they get to be, I guess it's a year or two old, they, uh, uh, that possibility is genetically shut off. They have the ability then to uh, eat fermented milk, uh, when it, a milk that's fermented in some way or another, but they cannot eat raw milk or any product of raw milk. And uh, what these people did is they apparently brought with them very precipitously, again, it happened extremely rapidly, they brought in new farming technologies never seen in that part of Europe before, and the ability to digest milk. And they intermarried, 
And if you look at maps today of, of Europe, of people who can digest raw milk, it's all the northern two-thirds. The further south you get, the less, uh, less ability the people have. When you get to a place like Asia, the ability to digest milk is very spotty. Uh, North America is very strong. Uh, and in fact, most of the people in the world can't really digest, uh, digest milk, bulk and population can't. So that was uh, a, a stunning, surprising, uh, uh, again, this is the pottery, is, uh, uh, this is the kind of house they built, great big long uh, shovels. Where would that house? Uh, Where would the house? Europe? Europe? In Europe, yeah, yeah, that's the kind of, uh, <laughs> I mean, right now the linear band people are found, uh, the, the, their, their remains are found in Europe. And the question always has been, where did they come from? Because they appeared very suddenly. And so archaeologists would tend to attribute them to neighboring tribes. Oh, they are a sudden development of such and such a tribe. But we are suggesting, in fact, they were outside because they probably came from the edge of the Black Sea, driven by the flood into southeastern Europe and brought with them uh, a new species of domestic animals and new techniques for farming and brought with it that wonderful genetic ability to uh, drink milk. Pottery that you were just showing, uh, the designs, was that indicative of the mind? I don't know if there are all these people, but in other words, there's still a lot of these in the design of pottery found in the different areas that you just showed. Oh, yeah, each group of people mostly had their own uh, type of pottery that they made. Uh, I don't know if any of this is fire pottery or not. Uh, <coughs> probably it is by this time, fire pottery. Okay, the other direction, and this is much more difficult. Uh, uh, we just aren't sure. You know, there was a very narrow shelf on the southern edge of the Black Sea, and there may and probably were people living there who were driven out. But if so, they would have come over the mountains. They would have come over the mountains and got out of the way. These, this would have been a pretty formidable area to settle in. One of them, the possibility is a, a, a place at, in the Konya Plain called Chateau Hoya, uh, which was a, a, a Neolithic village. It was deserted and then reoccupied, not reoccupied, but rebuilt about 7,500 years ago on, on the opposite side of the river. That's all very iffy, though. Um, we've been to a lot of these places. Bill and I had several trips to Turkey to look at some of these old uh, sites. Uh, this is Chateau Hoya. Uh, you can see the, the, the mud brick houses, and uh, uh, there's a lot of excavation has been going on. And this is a village that dates well, dates well before 5500 BC, well, well over 7,500 years ago. And one of the most fascinating things is we were there, and I was terribly ill. I had uh, I had uh, uh, Turkish tummy, and, uh, <laughs> and had an amazing cure. We were being we were taken there by B BBC, and uh, they were they were making a, a a film about this flood idea, and so I went to the director and I said I am sick. I'm scared as hell because I don't like the idea of going to the local hospital. I didn't, I didn't think I'd make it out of there alive. I have a very good friend in Istanbul. I was ready to call him and say, for God's sake, you're not going to get me. And uh, so the, the, the director said, oh, wait a minute. And he went and got a pill box. And there he said, uh, take, uh, two, take one of these right now, take uh, two more for the rest of the day, and then take these pills every day, take three a day. I said, how do you know they work? He said, well, before they, BBC lets us go into the field like this, we have to go to a dispensary. And they ask, where are you going? And we say, Turkey. What part of Turkey? Central Turkey, uh, w west to Istanbul. He says, take these, and take this, and take this. Here are the symptoms. And uh, if any of your people have the symptoms, give them the pills as directed. I was cured like that. <laughs> it was incredible. But. Um, uh, another thing that happened there, which was to me fascinating, was these are all mud brick homes, these things. And these are, again, 7,500 years old or older. And, you know, just loaves like a loaf of bread of mud brick. 
and they dry it out and they stick one on top of another and then they cover the outside with a kind of a mortar, you know, so that when, if the rain washes the mortar off, they just replace the mortar so you don't, so the house stands. And we went to a little village and I had, I sat in the bus, I was still pretty weak, I wasn't able to go in the house and participate. And I, I looked outside the bus, and there they were. The house I was looking at had been built like the description I read of the way they built houses 7,500 years ago. It was just loaves of dried mud with mortar covering them, and the mortar had fallen off a piece of the wall, and I could see it. And not only that, they always built them. This went, they always built them at the bottom of the wall would slope outward like that, so the water coming down would wash away from the building. It was, it was, pardon me? A little louder. A little louder, okay. Um, well, I'm almost through here. Uh, this is what Chapel Hoyt is possibly looked like when it was a, uh, um, fully occupied. Uh, you entered the house uh, through the roof. Uh, here are some of the walls. And here are, uh, here's, here's a, an aurochs, which was a wild kind of a, cattle that existed then, which were fearsome. The wingspan between the horns of these cattle was about uh, five feet or something like that. So it's extinct. Huh? It's extinct now? It's extinct now? That, uh, yes. Yeah. A what? <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm sorry, it's extinct, yeah. <laughs> but probably modern cattle from that area have descended from it. It was apparently a really fierce animal. Not, well, you know, wild Wild, wild anything is not really good to get messed up with. And these are some of the wall paintings from Chateau Hoyt, but we would suppose this probably is also a reflection of the kind of people that live in the area. Okay, to the south, and to the, here's the Black Sea again. Perhaps the LBK people went into Europe along with the Vincia. I think there's good reason to think these Vincia people came in. And then, but to, uh, to the south, and these, here's the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, Proto-Indo-Europeans, in other words, these are people, Proto-Indo-Europeans is a, a collection of people living together or in tribes closely associated with each other who spoke the original Indo-European language. From those people, all of the versions of the Indo-European -Indo languages we speak today descended. About 60% of the people in the world today speak a, a, a Proto-Indo-European language or uh, uh, or, or some, something that's closely related to it. Uh, the, the languages of, of India, Hindi and, and so forth, the, the language of, of um, Iran, which is, what is it? Uh, Farsi. Huh? Farsi, yeah, that's, a, that's an Indo-European language. Uh, half a dozen Indo-European languages in India and so forth. Okay, so you, this is highly speculative, the Ubaids, uh, seem to appear in Mesopotamia about this time, yet we found uh, very recently there was a, uh, a dig right in here, right in the under, about where it's the U and Abu Harara, and, and it was, they uncovered a Ubaid settlement, which uh, may have come from the north. Uh, one of the indications they came from the north, or at least had contact with the north, is they had obsidian knives, and obsidian didn't come from Mesopotamia or the south. Obsidian would have come from the volcanoes of Turkey. The Ubaids, uh, uh, one archaeologist loved to have uh, pre-dynastic Egyptians coming down along the coast here. Uh, uh, these uh, Indo-Europeans, eventually the Tukarian, that's also another Indo-European language, and other Indo-Europeans, you know, fleeing from this. Well, they, this is all fanciful, you know, we don't really know. Some of the kind of pottery that may uh, have, uh, these people may have brought musical note type of pottery, linear band, tonic. Okay, here's a very important point. This is a language tree, you can't see it. And the, the, the uh, genetic, you call it genetic history of languages is very controversial because how do you, there's no gene, that all, all you know is uh, words that you're speaking now. Or you, a language you may be certain is related to the words they are speaking. You, uh, what, what linguists assume 
is that there's a, a rather fixed rate at which words evolve in any language. So as they see a word in your language for uh, a, a chicken, and a word in a language which they, which they think is related to yours, which may have taken that word chicken but twisted it around a bit, they look at their word, they look at the word you use, and by try, they try to, to uh, guess how much time it took for that evolution to take place. It's a guess. And then a biologist and a linguist, they got together and they used what geneticists use, what uh, people who look at dinosaurs and so forth use, uh, 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 cladistics, which is a way of studying the family tree of animals and people. And so they applied cladistics to these Indo-European languages and they came up with a very, uh, amongst the other things, the, the uh, people said, no, 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 the, the European languages did not disperse to about three or 4,000 BC, and that is based on this study of the verbiage of the language. Uh, if you use the cladistics, you get a very different answer. That, uh, okay, these are the, the various, uh, various of the Indo-European languages. Uh, down here are the various Greek languages. Armenian is related to Greek. This is the Tokarian. Tokarian was found uh, uh, who lived north of these are all the Indian languages in here, Romani, uh, Bengalese, and uh, Punjabi, and so forth. So this is the a branch tree of the Indo-European languages of the Indian languages and the Greek. And let me go back one and we can see when they dispersed. Uh, so the Indian languages, uh, the form of the languages separated from the Greek form of the languages about 6,900 uh, years ago. And this, these ages are quite approximate. Uh, what this diagram is saying is no, the Indo-European languages did not disperse 3,000 years ago. They went through a long period of dispersal, starting at 8,700 years, but a major dispersal during this period of time when the European branches of the Indo-European of the Indo -European languages separated from the Indian and Anatolian uh, versions of those languages, perhaps about 6900 BC. The linguists are not happy about this at all. But too bad, you know? <laughs> okay, legends. How much time do I have? It's 8 o'clock, so I started when? About 10 hours. I'll be done in just a couple of minutes. Uh, legends. The Sumerian deluge legend appears to be an abbreviated creation story ending in a flood. Uh, Atrahasis, the story of creation. Uh, this is wonderful. This, these, these stories are great. There's no angry God in these old, these kind of legends. God is very whimsical, you know. But you, you kids are making too much noise. I'm going to flood you after all. <laughs> the story of creation, the revolt of the lesser gods, and creation of humankind to do all the work. Uh, the people were making too much noise, so they were punished with a plague. Uh, didn't work. A drop? That uh, didn't work at all. And finally, the flood. Well, that's got rid of most of them. And how many times, and particularly any of you who live in well, New York or and or the suburbs have wanted to send a flood <laughs> to the neighbor's house. And, and, you know, particularly if the neighbor has uh, kids who ride motorcycles and like to sit around at 2 o'clock in the morning and boom, 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 that kind of stuff. You know. The Gilgamesh epic goes, uh, Gilgamesh goes to see Utna Pishpin, who tells him the story of the flood. Uh, what, when were they committed to writing? writing? The biblical flood story, probably about 800 BC. Gilgamesh around the early second millennium, that would be between 2000 and 1000 BC. Uh, the Sumerian deluge legend, perhaps the earliest, but maybe just after about 3000, you know, 2500 to 3000 BC. Uh, all, and all the, these stories are all the same. There, there's a warning. Somebody builds a boat, loads animals on the boat with friends and neighbors, and, and uh, the flood comes. I, and, and none of them is sort of mention of rain uh, or a storm, a very violent storm. Well, this flood story was written almost um, 
5,000 years after um, this catastrophic flood in the Black Sea? Yeah, yeah. How can that happen? I'll tell you how it happens. Uh, uh, do you have any children? No? <laughs> how do I know? Come on. <laughs> no. Anybody with children, um, you've probably read uh, Green Eggs and Ham or some other story 1,000 times. 1,000 times. You get so get, your kid can't read. Your kid just sits in the and you read the story. So you decide, I'm going to skip a page. <laughs> Mommy! <laughs> try to skip a paragraph, try to skip a sentence, try to skip a word. No. You can't get away with it. Now, mind you, they can't read. They just memorize this story. Every word is so. So I think that's probably the way that happens. So the story was passed down. That's right, yeah. And probably more successful than that's what came in than anywhere else because there was a continuity of civilization without an awful lot of war. You know, Europe just went through horrible chaos uh, for years and so probably a lot of legend memory was destroyed in that, in that process. Uh, but that's a good question and it's, uh, <laughs> every time I say, have you ever read Green Eggs and Ham to your children, you know, at least uh, half the audience laughs. Yeah, we sure have. <laughs>